Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Emil Davila, and that's my Twitter username. So if you want to follow me, you will be fine. So I'm going to talk to you about uh, the relationship between semiotics, with, which is a social field, and um, DCI pattern. Can you hear me fine? Can you speak up just louder. a little bit? Yeah. Uh, like that? That's better. Okay. Speak louder or higher. Let me put it over here. Hook it to your beard. <laughs> <laughs> it works. Okay, over there? Yeah, yeah, better, thank you. Okay, thank you. No. I'm going to give it like this. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Okay, so <laughs> first before to start talking, uh, I want to give you a message from my community uh, in your way to your community. Uh, this is when I want to say to you, thank you for making this world a better place to code. Uh, so let's continue with a, with a little story. Actually, I'm from Ecuador. Uh, I live in the, I used to live in the middle of the planet, and a year ago, I decided to move to Uruguay, which is in the south part of the South America. Uh, I decided to move with my, with my wife, and actually I decided to move because uh, I was expecting a lot of great stuff to happen there. Uh, but I never thought that it's going to be kind of difficult to communicate with those people because actually they don't speak the same Spanish that I do. I used to expect that they say the same words or something like that, but it wasn't the same Spanish. So um, let me give you uh, a little example. For example, uh, this word, uh, which is salado, and we use it like a salty, uh, in Ecuador and Peru and Colombia and some other parts, uh, it has a negative connotation. Uh, we used to say it for something, for, for example, for someone has, uh, who's, someone who's, uh, who has bad luck. And in your way, and the other side, uh, salty, is used for someone who is an expert in something. So. For me, at the beginning, at least the first two months, uh, it was kind of difficult to understand them, so almost all the time I was in silence trying to traduce their Spanish to my Spanish. So, why I'm here? I'm here to try to complete this agenda. I'm going to uh, speak about semiotics. I'm going to speak about DCI, which is stands for Data Context Interaction. Uh, yesterday they were kind of teasing around it, so. I'm trying to, I will try to, to realize that. And I'm going to uh, talk about how they relate. So I have, until yesterday, I had two goals uh, for this presentation. After uh, yesterday, actually, today in the morning, uh, suddenly I have a new goal to, to complete here. So first goal is to convince you that semiotics can help you to understand not only your clients, but also, um, uh, improve the way that you uh, design and implement an architecture. Um, trying to implement it uh, following what the business is trying to express. So in that case, uh, trying to do a match between the user mental models and the architecture that's trying to, to express that, uh, that application. So the first one is what semiotics. Uh, actually, semiotics is the study of the signs, uh, which can be words, symbols, uh, body language, and how are they related, and actually how they acquire meaning. So for example, uh, you can have a logo and a slogan, um, some kind of body movements like touching your nose or uh, standing in some kind of way. And based on the cultural context, because this is the key word here, uh, the cultural context, uh, we are person, um, going, uh, we're going to relate it and give it some meaning based on uh, the, the, the context that we're uh, talking. So that's my kind of messy way to explain what uh, semiotic is. But for this talk, I need to explain you something more formal and I'm going to give you the basics. So it would be great that after this talk that uh, you do some kind of more research around it because there's a lot of relationships between social fields and and computer science. Actually, one of the branch of um, semiotics, it's called computer <coughs> semiotics, and it's the father of what we call now uh, human-computer interaction. So there's a lot of relationship. So, Fernanda Dushashu, 
Uh, he was a semiotician and he was a linguistic. Uh, he said that the language is a system of signs to express ideas which is comparable to any kind of symbol used for communication. He centers his studies into uh, the communication field, but uh, so he decided to split the, an, a symbol or a meaning in something like a coin with two faces. One of the faces, it's called the signifier, which is the object itself, a logo, a slogan, it, it's just the object, it doesn't have any kind of meaning, it's just there. And the other one is the signifier, which is the one, which is the, the concept that carries the meaning. And that's the one that, uh, based on the context, uh, allows you to understand um, what Olo is trying to say to you. So, a uh, few years later, uh, Charles Pierce says something like, okay, yeah, we have the object, we have the sign, but uh, actually, based on um, the, all the possibilities that around the possible signs, related to any object, we need some new concept. And he created the interpretant concept. It's not interpretant. I'm going to talk at, uh, about a few moments uh, later. So interpretant is something like a meta sign. It's going to explain the sign around the object. So it's going to relate the meaning uh, of this object. In this case, actually, it could be something like an infinite loop where uh, Interpretant it explaining a sign which is explaining a different sign, so that could be a definition. Uh, after that, Chuck Morris uh, Pearson said, "Okay, we have the way to express about the semiotics, but we need someone or something that could uh, give the meaning that we need for that symbol." So he uh, presents the concept of the interpreter, and this interpreter uh, appears based on the cultural context. So I'm going to keep repeating this word because it's uh, the key word for all the presentation, actually. So sorry for the redundance. Uh, and after that appears uh, probably my, one of my favorite writers, which is Umberto Eco, which, uh, who is also a, a semiotician. And he said, OK, the interpreter is fine, but it's not only necessarily a human. So you can see the relationship in this case with computer science where uh, not only human interacts with computers, probably a uh, different application or a different client needs interacted with it. So, uh, I'm sorry, I'm coming out of words. Um, uh, this was the basics. Uh, it would be great if after this, uh, this talk you could um, continue researching. So I'm going to go to the main topic. In this case, it's uh, DCI. So, um, one of the first questions that I want to answer is why I'm so excited about DCI. Yesterday there was a lot of this in about this concept. Uh, probably some of the guys here wants to, to kill me after this or throw me something. Um, but it's actually it's not a password. Uh, it has a uh, uh, honorable legacy. I don't know if that's uh, the, the, the real world to express it. But it was created by Rick Rengsko. I don't know if I pronounced it okay, but he was the one who presented the MVC pattern, uh, the one that we use every day, almost. Uh, he participated in the creation or the implementation of the small talk, which is, was the first uh, object programming language. He described the UML concept, and um, based on, all the, on this experience, uh, he later, around 1986, he uh, implement some kind of scripting language, who, which uh, after a few years became what we call now DCI. So formally, I will say that DCI is around us for, uh, I will say, 10 to 12 years, approximately. So it's not a password, it's not really new. The, 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 the issue here is that uh, as developers, we usually uh, try to, oh, we're working in some kind of uh, evolution spiral. So sometimes we forgot something that occurs in the past and suddenly we found it and improved it and appears like something new. So uh, basically the thing that I like about this year is that it minimizes any gap between the developer's mental model of the program and the program actually executed. And I'm taking the risk to say that it's not only the, the developer's mental model, but, but also the user's mental model. Because 
there's a relationship between the user and the client and the way that the system behaves. Instead of trying to teach the user to interact with the application, uh, actually DCI is trying to mimic uh, what the user models model, model is and represent it in the application. So reducing that gap, uh, actually the user could uh, work uh, very fast with the, with the system. So I'm going to explain to you kind of quick how DCI is implemented. So we have, sorry, so we have this layer which is the interaction. Actually, this layer uh, could be uh, the controller. Uh, something to notice here is that DCI is not different from MVC. Uh, you could put it uh, to work together uh, in composite patterns, so it doesn't matter how, how do you express them. So you have here interaction, and once you receive a request, for example, interaction only communicates through the context. And the context, uh, let's use uh, the, the classical example that you will find. We have in data, which is just raw data, we have the user, and the context uh, has the possible roles that the, this user could represent. For example, we got, in this case, an admin, or if we're talking about uh, financial software, we could talk about um, account manager, or if we talk about the journal system, we could talk about a subscriber role. So in this case, in any of these examples, the interaction communicates with the context, uh, sending the, 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 the kind of request, the, the kind of data he needs to, to respond. And the context decide which uh, it's the role that he needs to, to apply. So based on that, he will uh, perform all the logic, all the algorithms uh, through the data. And after that, uh, it will respond. Actually, this part is one of the problems that usually the, uh, the people see in BCI around the Ruby community. Um, basically because of this, almost all the blogs, almost all the documentation that you find around um, BCI and Ruby will use this user extend admin in dynamic loading. And the, the main complaint here is that it damaged the performance. Actually, that's right. It damaged the performance, but uh, we need to consider that Ruby is a dynamic language. So this is uh, one of its fantastic properties, and it's fine if we extend it dynamically, but if we need to remember that we don't need to overuse this property. Probably we could use a delegator, uh, it works the same way. Uh, a decorator, uh, it doesn't matter how we need to, to create it. Probably the dynamic loading solution could, um, could be possible in the case that we have some, uh, some complex logic that it's really uh, annoying or unnecessary to load uh, unless it's really, really requested. So I think that in that case is, uh, justified to use the dynamic loading. Otherwise, uh, we just uh, could stick to the classic way to, to load uh, modules or logic functionality. So, to be consistent with what I said, uh, this book written by James Coplin, uh, Lean Architecture, I, I recommend you to read it. Actually, Lean, it's another kind of password but actually it's not a password, it's a way to, it's a new methodology trying to complement Agile to create not only a working software, but a usable software. The, the, the software that needs to be, or that should um, be written or used by, by the current client. Actually, Lean, it's really old, it was developed around 1940s by Toyota, and suddenly about, Three or five years ago, the software community grabs that concept and start talking about in architecture. So we represent roles as identifiers. These roles may be just pointers to role-bound object or macros or, for, or functions or something else. So um, this something else, and this is the part that I want to to, to repeat. Uh, for example, in C++, it, it's not dynamic loading, so we cheated uh, using virtual classes. In Java, we use interfaces, and uh, we conform to the protocol to, to extend, in, that, in this case, the role. Actually, this book 
usually uh, almost all examples are using Java, and they talk about the methodless object, which is the Java interface, and the methodful uh, object, which is the, 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 the interface implementation. So this is actually why I'm so excited about DCI and why I don't think it's just a password. So what did I try to relate semiotics with DCI? Actually, there's a huge relationship here. So if you remember, it was, this was the diagram uh, I showed you before about the semioticians that were describing how uh, we as humans, uh, based on some cultural context, um, graph an object and given some meaning. So what if instead of object and sign, we call it data and context? Because the data is the raw object. It doesn't have any, any meaning. It's just over there. If we don't give it the meaning, the right meaning, uh, probably the same data could be used for account systems or for subscription systems. So actually, this, does, this, this is just a raw object. Actually, the context is the one that carries the meaning. Uh, that's uh, actually in, in the book that I showed you before. Uh, the context should uh, have a use case, should exist a use case per context, not a use case scenario. For example, you have an account system and you're going to talk about the account manager role. That role represents the, uh, the context. So all the possible scenarios around that role should be written in this context. So what we end with the program, we try to represent all possible contexts, is something like this uh, extended image, like a 3D. So where we have, for example, here the context for an admin, the content for the account manager, and the content for the customer. I'll lose the pointer. Um, so let's go back with the flat uh, diagram, which is more easy, with each easier, sorry. And, uh, Let's change another thing. We have the interpreter, we have the cultural context, and we have the interpreter. So let's change it to a more technical concept. And we have the interaction, which is the one that relates the context with the data. Uh, we have the client, with, who can be a human or not human, another application, another client, <laughs> another software. And instead of uh, the cultural context, we have the business domain context. Uh, based on that business domain context, uh, the user or our clients uh, will try to express what the application should do or should be or how it should be. So, this is how actually I related uh, the semiotics and the, and the DCI, and this doesn't appear actually in one or two days. Uh, one of my hobbies is read about sociology, uh, semiotics, uh, philosophy, and some other stuff uh, related to the social field. So when I found out about DCI two years ago, um, I was actually reading at that moment some of the Umberto Eco books, and I found the relationship. And for me, it looks like a funny thing. So that, that's how uh, I, I made the relationship. Something I like to, to notice here is I'm going to present you some uh, gem that I I've been working, uh, it's in the case of REST API interaction. Uh, in the case of REST API interaction, I'm going to do some changes here because uh, an, app, an API interaction doesn't work with, uh, with, with buttons or with film forms. It's just a request from a client to, the, to any resource. So my proposition, it's uh, considered that the interaction is actually the way that the client communicates uh, with the software. And that layer called interaction, or that directory called interaction where we place all the classes or all the routes that uh, manage the communication with the client, I, um, my proposal is to call it information. Because actually, the client is trying to grab some information from the resource. So because of this, actually, I think writing this, which is grapevine. Uh, I'm going to show you um, uh, some demo here. Uh, actually, grapevine is written thanks to grape, which is a micro framework uh, um, gem for REST API likes. And I'm using Roar also. So you can, if you want to, uh, 
uh, use hypermedia app in your, in your API. Actually, at the moment, it's just, as the slogan says, it's just a structure. It has four or five rubber methods around uh, the raw or the great uh, uh, gems. But actually, the idea is to improve it so it can become a, a framework by itself. So when you use it and you create an application, uh, you got RSpec debugger thing. Uh, I think that thing for development environment is more than enough. And you actually can use or decide to use Active Record or SQL. And for any of those, you could decide to use Postgres or MySQL. So this is the URL of Grapevine. Uh, if you want to check it, it will be great. And this is the repository of, of the gem. When you install it, uh, you can call it uh, with any of these possible options. Uh, you could say with DVD SQL and DVMS uh, parameter uh, Postgres or uh, uh, using Active Breaker or MySQL, however you want. And the base command it's calling just grapevine new and the call of your or your API. And at that moment, I will create uh, an structure. So following some some standards or some ways that I think that it, it looks great for some uh, structural application. So we have the application directory, the config directory, the leaf, and the spec. Uh, the important part here is the config directory where we have the application. I'm going to show you later, but this is how it will look the class. Uh, where it says mount roots, actually it's one of the wrapper methods I was talking before. Instead of using the great methods of trying to um, declare inside of the same page, inside of the same file, all the all the possible roots, you could decide to use a different version for your API and just included it here uh, using mount roots. Actually, there's another wrapper method called mount helpers. Uh, which will help you to include some modules for your for your API instead of using uh, instead of uh, placing all the helpers inside of the same file uh, just as they propose you. And this is basically grep methods. And if you have tried uh, Cuba or Sinatra, it works almost similar. So the other important directory it's app where we have the context, uh, the, got the data, the decorators, the helpers, the information. And if you want to use uh, RUAR for hypermedia, you could use uh, this directory, which is representers. Instead of information, you will create uh, different versions based on the directory. So you can have version one, version two, version three. And inside of there, you could create routes are that RB and place just the logic of that version of you your API. So actually, you could, for example, say in here, OK, I'm going to expose to my API the version 1, the version 3, and the version 4, but not version 2, because probably something's broken. So let me give you a quick demo. Um, Here. I think command F1 will mirror it so you can see it on your screen and the. Um, I click the incorrect checkbox. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So let me know if you can see it. Okay, so actually, I already um, installed the gem and doing some bundle installs, so I'm going to show you just how you can uh, code it. So, for example, we could get it this way. Grapevine new, um, my crazy API. We just wait, um, inform you that if you're going to use uh, a database connection, you should um, configure a .dem file. Actually, it would came with a .dem, that example file. Um, uh, 
Once you are inside, we just start the server. Example. So here we are. Uh, I'm going to show you uh, the reason for why I create Grapevine. It's actually my big project over there in Uruguay. It's an API for the public transportation uh, lines and stops. So. Actually, I spent almost two or three hours trying using Grape to structure the application. And actually, what I found out after the two hours that with um, this structure following some guidelines, uh, any new resource or any new concept required by the, by the client was actually a matter of minutes to, to implement it. So um, there are some things here, some things that uh, are not implemented in the the grapevine because grapevine appears after this. But uh, for example, we have here all the all the structure, basically the same structure. The directory would have it's missing. It's called the the root centers, and we have um, this is the root file. So as you can see, uh, we have here um, at the great uh, way to include helpers. We can use helpers and a lot of lines of the possible the helpers that we want to include. So that's why I created the wrapper method. And for example, we created here resource bus stops. Uh, we have the, all the possible roads. And we have here the declaration of the context. Actually, in my API, there's no something like an admin role or, or any kind of role. So, uh, actually, the context is trying to represent the use, the, every use case for the for this application. So in this case, I have the bus stop context, which uh, explores all the possible scenarios around where is located, uh, where 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 are the most near location or most near stop near to you, um, and also the line context, which represents the routes of the bus lines. So uh, this is the helper down here, uh, where I just, instead of uh, extending like a module, I'm just instantiated an object. In this case, a uh, bus stop uh, context, or in this case, a uh, line context. And using decorators, actually, uh, this is the model. As you can see, it's uh, really thin. It just uh, contains the relationship. And in this case, the decorator. Uh, actually, here I'm um, placing all uh, possible uh, queries for this model object in a kind of syntactic sugar uh, syntax. So I can call, give me all all the stuff for this post line description, or give me all across this street, or based on this stuff, give me give me all the information, and. Actually, we have here the bus stop context, where we can mix all possible objects. For example, I'm using here a bus stop decorator uh, with this another object that is inside of the structure uh, to create actually the the later response. So, um, example, let me let me show you the main context. As you can see here, for example, I'm joining the subline uh, scenario where I want to know which is the subline. And the way that you can see it is actually here. It's, I'm not using for this uh, hypermedia bit, but uh, you can see that I'm just rendering the response uh, for the geolocalization I'm using in this, uh, in this case, PostGIS. 
And actually, I've been creating the iOS AP, uh, the iOS client. So I hope this uh, behaves well because of the network connection is kind of slow. Oh yeah. So you can see uh, based on the on the way that it is structured, it's easier to implement a new functionality and it becomes kind of faster to to respond to the request. So basically, that's what Grapevine is, and I hope that you really like it. It will be great that uh, one of my of my main desires are to um, to sorry, yeah, uh, to expand it, to create it um, uh, as a micro as a micro framework, uh, because I think that a well structured application it's fine for any way to to try to describe what we do. So, to try to expand that, I two years ago, I found uh, about uh, this essay created by, or written by Richard Gabriel called Patterns of Software, uh, a tales a story from the software community. And actually I really like it because he was inspired by this guy who was an architect, Christopher Alexander. In 1970s, he wrote this book, A Foreign Language. Uh, it wasn't well received by the architect community, but uh, 10 years later, the software community actually uh, thanks to him for reading this. Because for me, and if you read it, actually it looks like he's the father of the design patterns. So one of the quotes in Richard Gabriel's book is, in a good design, there must be an underlying correspondence between the structure of the problem and the solution. And I think this is the root of all what we do. Uh, trying to understand the problem, which is, uh, which is there, we cannot do anything about it, and try to explore possible solutions around it and find the proper one. So this is why semiotics or any social field could help us to understand all the possible solutions around the problem. So I'm going to finish with um, my other two goals here, uh, the ones you remember is try to convince you. I hope I, I achieve that goal. The other one was to show you Grapevine and try not to convince you, but to show you that Grapevine can help you to architect a very well structured uh, API. And as I was saying before, uh, trying to convert it in a, in a framework. But since yesterday, a very actually uh, different goal, which is instead of trying to convince you to, that Grapevine can help you to architect uh, a well-structured API, uh, DCI can help you to architect a well-structured API. So I hope uh, you understand me. Um, you can see I made this kind of messy. So thank you.